Live from Case at 12, the news at noon starts right now. And we start with the first black secretary of state and chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the U.S. who spent his entire adult life serving his country. Colin Powell, who served as America's top soldier and later as America's top diplomat, has died. ABC's Ike Jochi reports Powell's family says he died of complications due to COVID-19. After four decades of public service, former Secretary of State and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Colin Powell, the first black man to hold each of those positions, died Monday morning due to complications from COVID-19, among other health issues. He was fully vaccinated. In a statement, the Powell family thanking the medical staff at Walter Reed, writing, we have lost a remarkable and loving husband, father, grandfather, and great American. This morning, former President George W. Bush acknowledging the passing of his former Secretary of State, writing, Laura and I are deeply saddened by the death of Colin Powell. He was a great public servant. General Powell is an American hero, an American example, and a great American story. That story starting in Harlem, where he was born of Jamaican parents, growing up in the South Bronx, eventually graduating from City College of New York. Powell entering the Army through ROTC. As a young second lieutenant, he served two decorated combat tours in Vietnam, later serving as a national security advisor to President Ronald Reagan at the end of the Cold War. He served under four presidents, highlighted by his appointment to Secretary of State under President George W. Bush. But his service was not without controversy. Powell was heavily criticized around the world for his speech at the United Nations in 2003, attempting to justify the U.S. invasion of Iraq. There can be no doubt that Saddam Hussein has biological weapons. Those weapons were never found. Powell said his speech about Iraq having WMDs was an intelligence failure. Still, highly regarded by America's political leaders, receiving the Presidential Medal of Freedom twice. He was 84 years old. A man who was respected around the globe. Quite frankly, it is not possible to replace a Colin Powell. Powell spent his entire adult life in service to his country. He leaves behind his wife of 48 years, Alma Powell, and his son, Michael. Ike Ajachi, ABC News, Washington. Back here at home, starting today, you can voice your opinion about several proposed Texas constitutional amendments. It is the first day of early voting. Early voting runs through October 29th. Voters will decide on eight proposed constitutional amendments in the statewide election. The constitutional amendments cover a range of topics, including taxes, judicial eligibility, religious freedom, and development. Those living in District 118 will also get to vote on a new Texas House representative. Republican John Lujan and Democrat Frank Ramirez are vying for the empty seat left by former Representative Leo Pacheco. You can take a closer look at what's on the ballot on KSET.com. You can also find a list of voting locations on our website. New at noon, a not too appetizing story at lunchtime. A West Side restaurant receiving a low score. City health officials gave that score after pest droppings were found in the storage area. Tony's Tacos to Go, located in the 1400 block of Casterville Road near South General McMullen, receiving a score of 76. It was also cited for having a urinal that was out of order. Restaurant staff also using trash bags to cover baking sheets of dough and beef stored in a walk-in cooler that was not covered. If you have a complaint about a restaurant, you can contact Metro Health by email or call 210-207-8853. Some people in San Antonio may not have running water tomorrow. That's because that's when the San Antonio water system is set to resume water shutoffs. A moratorium has been in place since the beginning of the pandemic. The shutoffs will affect customers who have bills that are past due. However, most customers with high balances have been automatically enrolled in a four year payment plan. For more details, head to KSAT.com. San Antonio now a hub for innovation and business. There are so many places that help companies grow and one of them is called Velocity Texas. The campus is the Center for Biotech Innovation powered by Texas Research Technology Foundation. Max Massey takes us inside at the campus and introduces us to a company that is looking to change the world of prosthetics. I made a promise to myself and everyone that I knew that I would use this degree to help better the world. 
and I have been very fortunate in that I get to do that, but that is the biggest God. meaning for me. Ryan and his team started building prototypes like this one in college. He graduated from UTSA in May of 2020, and his company, Alt Bionics, has been growing fast. I knew exactly what I wanted to do moving forward, and it was build these devices and see if I could build them for less, because traditionally they cost anywhere from $10,000 to $150,000. My final year at university, with the help of an amazing team, we developed this bionic hand for $600. There are more than 2.2 million Americans who have lost limbs for a variety of reasons. Serving our country, cancer, the reasons are endless, but Ryan and his company, Alt Bionics, they are striving to help out. Ryan and Alt Bionics, one of the many companies here in San Antonio, here at Velocity, Texas, ready to make a big difference across the country and across the world. Well, the main goal is to actually have a state-of-the-art facility where entrepreneurs and biotechnology can come, grow their company, create jobs and wealth for the city. And of course, it's pretty cool because these innovations will ultimately, ultimately save and improve the quality of life it's of many people around the world. The biggest thing is helping amputees regain independence in their daily lives. So that's the biggest thing. And then our goal is to get it out to those who need it across the world, not just here in the US. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. A new episode of KSAT Explains will be released tomorrow night. This week, the team is spotlighting some of the groundbreaking work that local scientists are doing at Texas Biomedical Institute. As the world changes due to the pandemic, science has been able to provide hope in the form of treatments and vaccines, and some of that groundbreaking research done right here in San Antonio. We helped in testing of vaccines that have been given to a billion people worldwide in monkeys last year, and we helped in testing of therapeutics that doctors are now giving to people. In this week's episode of KSAT Explains, the team introduces us to some of the San Antonio scientists behind some of the crucial COVID research and how those breakthroughs could help us battle future viruses and diseases. You can watch it tomorrow night at 7 on KSAT.com or on the KSAT TV app. Our cool mornings will start to go away. More humidity on the way. Your forecast also coming up. And the Cowboys come up with a huge win on the road in New England, but Dak is injured. What happened to him? Coming up in sports. Jury selection has officially kicked off in the Ahmad Arbery case. The unarmed black man killed while jogging near his home. I'm Rena Roy, and I'll have the latest coming up. A big day in the courtroom, a jury selection underway now in the death of Ahmad Aubrey. He was an unarmed black man who was shot and killed while jogging not too far from his Georgia home early last year. Three men are charged with that murder in what prosecutors call a racially motivated attack. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest from Brunswick, Georgia. The trial is being called one of the biggest in Georgia state history. And now jury selection is getting underway in the case against those charged in the death of Ahmaud Arbery. Potential jurors asked to fill out a three-page questionnaire asking if they followed the case and what they already know about it. The jury that we're going to be pooling is going to have to make a decision about whether or not this was something that should have occurred. And it has a lot of racial implications. Protesters gathering outside the courthouse in Brunswick, Georgia, ahead of of the trial, including Arbery's family. We don't want anyone to ever forget about Ahmad because his death made plenty and a lot of changes around the world. The case sparking national outrage after the 25 year old was fatally shot in February of last year while on a jog near his home. Father and son Gregory and Travis McMichael, along with neighbor William Ronnie Bryan, who filmed the shooting, all facing murder charges. Simply because a case is in the media doesn't mean that you can't find jurors uh, who will uh, be able to approach the, the case without you know, having already made up their minds. Prosecutors say the video shows the McMichaels chasing Arbery, who was unarmed. Brian joined in, catching Arbery's final moments on camera shortly after this brief altercation, allegedly showing Travis shooting and killing Arbery. This is a litmus test as to where the country is, particularly where the South is, uh, in the racial reckoning that we 
we experienced in 2020. McMichael's attorneys say their clients suspected Arbery was a burglar and they were trying to make a citizen's arrest after seeing this security video of him entering a nearby home under construction. Those lawyers tell ABC News they're hoping for a fair jury. All three defendants have pled not guilty. The jury selection process is expected to take 14 days. Then the trial will begin, which will likely last about three weeks. Rena Roy, ABC News, Brunswick, Georgia. Outside with live and what a gorgeous weekend. Oh my goodness, it really was. And uh, I hope everyone got their Halloween decorations back in their yard after that stiff wind that we had. <laughs> it was gusty, but you guys are right. The weather has turned out to be really beautiful. This is our sweet spot time of year where we get those comfortable afternoon highs in the 70s. That's exactly what we're looking for today. The aquifer is up yet again, up half a foot to 666 even. And in your pollen count, we have low counts of mold and ragweed. Today is the anniversary of a big event, weather event here in South Texas. We'll tell you what it is coming up. KSAT 12 presents another Day of the Dead story. Building the Ofrenda. Brought to you by Toyota. Building an ofrenda is an important Day of the Dead tradition. These altars have many pieces and parts and they each have a specific purpose. The colorful skulls found on many ofrendas are called sugar skulls. These days they may not be made out of sugar, but in the beginning they were. The art of molding granulated sugar and meringue was brought to Mexico by the missionaries. With sugar in abundance, it became a popular art supply in colonial times. So the first sugar skulls were not candy, they were decorative. So why a sugar skull? They symbolize many things, one being the sweetness of life. Originally placed on graves, the rain and wind would eventually wash them away. So they're also used to remind us of our mortality. To honor their loved one, people usually write the name of the departed on the sugar skull's forehead. It's a sweet thing to do. The weekend was just about as good as you could get. You know, cool you're right, uh, calling it the kind of the sweet spot of uh, weather, this is yes. this is it. Not too hot, not too cold. Exactly. Sun Although the mornings are a little warmer than they were Saturday and Sunday, what happened? Well, we actually did get down into the 40s this morning. Yeah. So it was the second morning in a row. But it, yeah, the mornings are gonna start kind of moderating a little bit warmer next few days. So maybe back into the 50s and 60s. Guys, it's also the anniversary of the 98 flood. We remember this one so very oh. well. I know you guys do for sure. Uh, October 17th and 18th, 1998, there it is. Um, you know, this was an interesting event in the sense that we look back at last week, we had that hurricane in the Pacific, if you remember, supplied us a bunch of moisture. In 98, we actually had two hurricanes out in the Pacific that supplied moisture, a stationary front, and boy, the ingredients really came together back then. More than 20 inches of rainfall, 31 deaths, unfortunately, and 1.19 billion dollars in damage. Still one of the costliest floods across the country. Uh, it was just such an incredible event. And, and thankfully last week didn't pan out like 98 did. We did have a, a lot of moisture and obviously we did see some flooding, but it wasn't quite as bad. Uh, and as we look at the aquifer from last week's good rains from that tropical moisture that we got, the aquifer is up half a foot today to 666 even. But as we look back in time here since Wednesday, we're up 6.8 feet. That's really good. We've come up above that 660 mark, obviously. So has the 10-day rolling average, but it doesn't mean that we're out of stage one restrictions just yet. That is up to uh, SAWS and city council. And so it may be a little while longer, but we are headed in the right direction. 44 this morning, 43, uh, 44 in Kerrville this morning, 43 in Bernie stage, 49 at the airport. So our second morning in a row here where we were down below 50 degrees, 48 in Hondo, 49 in Pleasanton. 50 increase those springs this morning. So it was a great, great start. As you look across the country, it was 49 here. Notice the temperature in New York this morning, 49. It was 47 in Caribou, Maine. Uh, we were not even uh, that much warmer than places like International Falls, which is always really cold, 35. So really, we were in pretty good shape compared to the rest of the country. There's nothing that's terribly cold out there. And uh, temperatures are going to warm up nicely. It's actually a pretty quiet weather pattern for not only us, but the entire country. Few thin high cirrus clouds off in the distance. Temperatures at this hour are at 70 degrees. Southeasterly winds, that's an important uh, indicator there. Southeasterly winds, that means that the dew point is going to start to come up now that we've seen that wind sort of switch around a little bit. We'll keep an eye on that. 
Very little cloud cover. You saw some of those very thin high clouds coming across the sky. We're seeing a few of those out there. 72 New Braunfels, 71 in Seguin, 66 Bernie Stage, 78 right now in Katua. Here's the setup. I mentioned it's pretty quiet. There is one storm system up across the Pacific Northwest producing some snow and rain there. We have high pressure anchored off to our east, and that's bringing that easterly, but now starting to see more of that southeasterly wind. And we'll definitely see that tomorrow. So that'll start to usher in the moisture slowly but surely, and so dew points will be on the rise. Today, dew points in the 40s, tomorrow, dew points in the 50s, and by the time we finish out the week, we've got dew points in the 60s. It's not going to be overly muggy, but you may start to feel it some. 78 degrees, you forecast high today, easterly winds to southeasterly winds, 5 to 10 miles per hour. Extended forecast, we'll go 82 tomorrow. We may start off with a little bit of patchy morning fog, and then 84 Wednesday, 86 Thursday, mid to upper 80s by the weekend. There were some indications that maybe we get a few rain showers by Friday, Saturday, Sunday, although the models are kind of backing off of that idea. So just a slight chance for shower to Saturday and Sunday. Guys. Well, what a fantastic week. Nice. Thank we're, you. We're kind of doing one week on, one week off here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> we can get used to this. Yeah. Cowboys pull off an impressive road win in New England despite some big mistakes. And an unusual move for a high school in the middle of the season. Abbott at Judson coming up. Pro football coverage. Powered by Davis Law Firm. Not yet, but that will be an injured Dak Prescott. More on that in a minute. Before that, the Cowboys were on a wild victory ride against New England yesterday. Patriots get it going first. Damon Harris scores from four yards out. 7-0 Pats. Cowboys respond. Dak to a wide open Blake Jarwin for a one-yard touchdown. Tied at seven. And it's Mac Jones finding Hunter Henry. Where's Hunter? There he is right there. Lays out for it, 14-7 after one. Look at the second quarter, Pats up 14-10 and punting, but it's blocked by Luke Gifford. The Cowboys recover at the 17-yard line. Cowboys driving third and goal from the one. And Dak Prescott has half his body across the goal line. Referees don't see it. They don't review it. Mark short. So next play, Dak tries to reach the ball over, but it's knocked loose before it breaks the plane. New England recovers, Pats up 14-10 at halftime. Cowboys have two turnovers at the break. Third quarter, Dak to C.D. Lamb. Gets both feet down. Cowboys up 17, 14 after three. That's a Cowboys 2,500 touchdown. That's a lot. The most in the NFL history. Fourth quarter, 2014. Dallas, Ramadi Stevenson scores. New England leads 21-20. Under three to play. Jones over the middle. It's tipped and then picked by Trayvon Diggs. He's bringing it back 42 yards. A pick six. 26-21 Cowboys. Next play for the Patriots. Jones going deep. Kendrick Bourne just put the double move on Diggs, and he's digging for the end zone. A 75-yard catch and run. Two-point conversion good. 29-26 Pats. 20 seconds left. Greg Zerline ties it. 49 yards out. It's 29 all. We're going to overtime in OT. Cowboys march downfield. Dak connects with C.D. Lamb for the 35-yard game-winning touchdown. And what a game it was. Here is your final. Cowboys come from behind to win this one. 35-29 in overtime. We, you know, we knew this was going to be a dog fight. We knew this was going to be a huge challenge coming in here. And, um, you know, I, and I really do, uh, you know, you, you need these kind of wins. It doesn't matter how many quarters it take, four, five, six, maybe if needed. Uh, but, you know, I'm happy to come out with this win with these guys, and I can't wait to go celebrate with them. Even though it wasn't fully, you know, wasn't everything going our way, you know, we still overcame that and, you know, came out with the win. That just shows a lot, you know, shows the kind of type of fight this team has, and, you know, I'm excited. Uh, we know we're for real, and we believe we're for real. I don't think we're necessarily out here trying to send a message to anybody more so than we're um, showing it to ourselves. You see him limping off the field right there. He actually strained his calf on that last play. He'll have an MRI today, but says he is okay. Here's the good news. Cowboys are on their bye week next weekend, and then they play the Vikings on Sunday, October 31st at U.S. Bank Stadium. So Dak gets some time to rest. All right, now Texans and Colts, both teams one and four, both desperate for a win. This was all Indy. Carson Wentz finds Paris Campbell, and this is going to be a 51-yard touchdown. Colts up 7-0 after one. They led 10-3 at the half. Third quarter, Colts slammed the door shut on Texans. Wentz finds Mo Ali Cox for the 28-yard touchdown. Next drive, Jonathan Taylor scores from four yards out. Texans have not scored a touchdown in two of their last three games. Houston now has lost five in a row. Here is your final, 31-3 Indianapolis over Houston. Houston now 1-5.
Next up for the Texans, it's the Cardinals, undefeated Cardinals. That'll be next Sunday, 325 State Farm Stadium. And this was breaking news on Insta Replay last night. Justin head coach Rodney Williams has been relieved of his head coaching duties. The Rockets football program effective immediately. And offensive coordinator Joel Call has been named interim head coach for the rest of the season. That's according to the executive director of athletics, Treva Corrales. Justin is in the middle of their worst season ever at 2-5. and five. They are 1-3 and three in District 27-6A, where normally they are the team to beat. And they are coming off their first loss to East Central in over 40 years on a last second Hail Mary touchdown. Here's the complete statement from Corrales she gave us last night. She said Justin ISD extends its sincere gratitude for the work and service that Coach Rodney Williams has done for the student athlete, athletes and football program at Judson High School as the head football coach. Although it was difficult, the district has chosen to move in a different direction regarding the program. Coach Joel Call has been named as interim head coach for the remainder of the season. A search for a new head football coach will commence in the offseason. Seems to be a lot of that going around. Yeah, it's, uh, it's tough, especially when it happens in the middle of the season. Oh, yeah. But Judson, Judson's known to win, so you got to win out there. Yeah. A Michigan down lacking a basic necessity, safe drinking water. It may finally have a permanent solution, though. The plan to replace that community's pipes and why it's crucial for public health. And a battle over a COVID-19 vaccine mandate could leave a major city without nearly half of its police force. Those details coming up in the next half hour. A massive kidnapping of Americans in Haiti uh, spurring an urgent effort to get Americans released. Ohio-based Christian Aid Ministries confirming that the 16 Americans and one Canadian, including five children, all on their way back from visiting an orphanage on Saturday, were kidnapped, the youngest of them reportedly just two years old. The Haitian government saying they suspect one of the country's most dangerous gangs is behind the kidnapping. The same gang is believed to have kidnapped French priests and nuns in April. The group was eventually released. Public safety concerns rising in Chicago. Nearly half of the city's police officers could be placed on unpaid leave for refusing to disclose their vaccine status. In a department-wide memo, the superintendent says that officers will be given a direct order to submit their vaccination status. And if they don't, the memo warns they could be fired. The police union president, after repeatedly publicly telling officers to resist the mayor's mandate, was ordered by a judge to stop publicly encouraging officers to disobey. Now there are concerns the standout between police and the mayor's office will lead to police staffing shortages in a city battling to curb violence. Roughly 38 percent of the sworn officers on this job, almost 40 percent, can lock in a pension and walk away today. Meanwhile, in California, Governor Newsom issued a vaccine mandate for children in schools that will likely not go into effect until 2022. However, some parents are already protesting the decision, keeping their children home from school today. Many people missed their regular medical appointments during the pandemic. They still are. And that includes breast cancer and cervical cancer screenings. With more on the problem of that, here's ABC's Alex Prashay. During the height of the pandemic, access to cancer screening tests was limited. Because of that, the number of breast cancer and cervical cancer screening tests performed fell. The CDC National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program says its screenings went down by 87% for breast cancer and 84% for cervical cancer. Screening percentages went down even more for some women of color. It is thought that this could further widen the gap for cancer-related health care in minorities. The CDC encourages health care professionals to not delay screening tests for high-risk individuals. With this Medical Minute, I'm Alex Prechet, ABC News. And those screenings are also important when it comes to breast cancer, since early detection is the key to surviving it. University Health offering several options for getting a mammogram, and one of those options is mobile mammography through the Healthy You Express that can be sent to your place of business at no charge. The Healthy You Express bus is part of University Health's continued commitment to help women in San Antonio and Bear County access mammograms more easily. It only takes about 30 minutes and patients get the results within 24 hours. Financial assistance is available to everyone who qualifies and we have more information 
on the community section of KSAT.com. Michigan Governor Gretchen Whitmer says she now has an 18 month plan to get safe drinking water to a Michigan town. The governor is ordering all lead pipes to be replaced in Benton Harbor, which has been plagued by lead in its water for years. Those pipes are set to be replaced by 2023. The problem won't be easy or cheap to fix, but the impact replacing those pipes could be pretty large. If we actually eliminated lead in the environment, dug up those pipes, cleaned up those old homes, we would actually save our nation $80 billion a year in societal savings. Yeah, right now, residents cannot drink, bathe with, or even brush their teeth with the water coming out of those faucets. Looking outside with live cam, what's not to like? Well, yeah, it is Monday, but <laughs> the weather's really nice. We'll focus on the positives here, the, the blue skies at the great uh, afternoons we're going to see next couple days. And really, it was a great weekend, too. Highs only in the 70s today. There are not a lot of days in the year that we see highs in the 70s here in San Antonio, so we'll soak it up. Let's show you the visible satellite picture, the, actually the uh, just the satellite picture. You can see some of the clouds coming in from the west. No big deal, though. These are those thin, high clouds. Won't make much of a difference, and they may not even make it here. So we'll see plenty of sun today. Uh, no rain associated with these clouds either. We'll call it a mostly sunny day, but you can see a few of them there off in the distance. Temperatures at this hour are at 70 degrees. Dew point is at 54. Southeasterly winds at about 10 miles per hour. Now with the southeasterly wind, we will see the dew point start to come up just a little bit. Not to where you'll really notice it, I don't think. Not until tomorrow or maybe Wednesday, but uh, they are starting to creep up a little bit, those dew points. 68 degrees, Canyon Lake, 69 in Comfort, 72 Rio Medina, 73 down there in Divine. And one of the warm spots today, Pleasanton, you're at 77. But it's not that warm, so it still feels pretty nice. 78 uh, by 5 o'clock here in San Antonio, 73, 7 o'clock down to 65 by the 10 o'clock hour. East Julie to Southeast Julie winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. And we've got some more good weather coming up this week. We'll take a look ahead to the rest of your work week here in just a few minutes. Guys. Thank you, Justin. A surprise here oversees the report of a Chinese missile test. It reportedly shows progress with an advanced weapon called a hypersonic missile. ABC's James Longman has details. This demonstrates a huge step forward in China's military capability, and it's actually understood that the United States had no idea that China was this far ahead. All this is according to Britain's Financial Times newspaper, and they say that this summer, China managed to launch a nuclear-capable hypersonic missile into space, where it then circled the globe before cruising towards its target. These missiles can actually travel at five times the speed of sound, and they do fly lower than the average ballistic missile, which means that they are very difficult to trace. They uh, can also be maneuvered while they're in the air. So essentially it means that China is close to being able to launch a nuclear warhead against any other nation and there'd be no warning or any defense against it. Now, as you might expect, China has denied that it was a hypersonic missile. They say it was actually a routine test to verify reusable technology, but this test at the time was shrouded in secrecy. The US and Russia are also trying to develop this kind of technology, but it's thought they're way behind China on this particular arms race. It's understood this missile on this occasion landed some 25 miles from its intended target, but I think it's only a matter of time before they have a significant advantage over the United States. James Longman, ABC News in London. A killer debut for a well-known villain. A look at the top films in the box office this weekend coming up. The term Chicano is derived from indigenous groups, and while it's been around for decades, it's a term that has had a bit of a rebirth. R.J. Marquez spoke with a professor at Palo Alto College to learn more about its origins and the future of the term. The term Chicano or Chicana is an identifier that became popular during the U.S. Civil Rights Movement and specifically during the Mexican-American Civil Rights Movement, also known as the Chicano Movement. This social and political movement lasted from the 1940s to the 70s, and it was an important moment in the history of many Mexican-Americans. Out of that movement came this, um, this kind of consciousness raising of, of um, Americans of Mexican descent who felt this, this new sense of pride in being indigenous Americans. We're trying to bring to light was that 
We don't have to assimilate. And while the movement itself was based on resistance and improving social, economic, and working conditions for Mexican-Americans, the term Chicano has a rich history that dates back to Mesoamerican cultures before the arrival of the Europeans. And that's where the term Chicano comes from. It's from the Mexica, the indigenous uh, Mesoamerican empire. We we look at the term um, like Mexico, right? It comes from the Mexica, which is the original term for the Aztecs in, in that um, area. Dr. Rodriguez said as the Chicano movement ended, the term Hispanic was introduced in census data by the U.S. government as more of a blanket term. This led to a shift away from the use of Chicano. Instead of changing the system, kind of like trying to fit into the system, right? Saying we're American, you know, we're, you know, Hispanic, which kind of privileges Spain, which is European, right? So you see this um, these, these kind of, you know, these, these politics behind these terms. But the term Chicano has continued to evolve, even diving deeper into indigenous cultures. And then there's Chicanex with an X, starting with an X. So it starts and ends with the X, and the X honors the Nahua language, which largely had the X um, as the CH sound. And like the use of the term Chicano, Chicana, or Chicanex, the language honors the Nahual people who are the largest indigenous group in Mexico. And that was our R.J. Marquez. Very interesting. Outside with Lycan, we're kind of stair-stepping into cooler temperatures. We take a step down, and then we kind of like level out, and we take another step and level out. We're getting there. Well, this is that yeah, this is that time of year where we start to see some fronts come through, and we'll get kind of that back and forth going on. We're, we're going to see some slightly warmer lows, so low temperatures as we go forward in time. But this morning we got down to 49, which was uh, really really nice. The averages are 82 and 60, so obviously we're below average. We'll be below average for the high too. Records are 93 and 45. We came within just four degrees of that record low set back in 1903. We'll have a look ahead to the weekend. It does include some small rain chances coming up. This is your daily tech and business briefing from Cheddar News. Apple set to announce a new line of Macs at their Unleashed event today, along with a slew of other new products. The big ticket product set to debut is a redesigned MacBook Pro that will feature 14 and 16 inch screens. There's also been rumors that the Macs will be powered by new, more powerful chips. Meanwhile, high inflation prices are expected to carry over into next year. That is labor and supply shortages continue to plague the U.S. Inflation projections from economists are significantly up from July's numbers and are not expected to decline until the middle of next year. That's according to a survey done by the Wall Street Journal. It also shows about half of the respondents believe that supply chain bottlenecks are the biggest threat to inflation for the next year. And GitLab has gone from rebuilding in the shadows to now being worth more than twice their competition. The software company now worth $16.5 billion. That after debuting at the NASDAQ last Thursday, shares already up 21% since they opened. GitLab has long lagged behind their rival company, GitHub, that after the latter was bought for $7.5 billion by Microsoft in 2018, a time where GitLab was only valued at $200 million. And that's Cheddar News Business and Tech Update. I'm Baker Machado coming to you from Cheddar Studios in Lower Manhattan. We've always seen some wonderful pictures from our viewers, especially I think the fall, the spring, and then the fall. We really get some nice pictures yeah. in the fall, especially sunsets are always nice, but I think you got one. My favorite. Yeah, this is this is a great picture. We got this in this morning on our case. Oh, wow. wow, that looks like a painting. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? So it just sets the scene. This was after the rain at Padre Park along the San Antonio River. I think wow. this was probably last wow. week. But yeah, everything's green, the sun. Ah, this is a great time of year. One of those canvases, you know, you can put that on, make it look like a painting. I think you should. I think they absolutely should. Not sure wow. who submitted it. Uh, anonymous there, but beautiful shot nonetheless. We do appreciate it. We love the pictures. Uh, you can submit one through our, submit the pictures through our KSAT weather app. Rainfall from last week, well, it totaled up now to 31.46. That's a total for the year, I should say. And we're up four inches above the average. Uh, that's, that's doing pretty well. Del Rio is a little bit below average, still 2.3 uh, inches below. Del Rio could use a little bit more rain out west. They just can't seem to get the, the heavier storms out there. But hopefully we can end the year. Everyone can be maybe in the positive territory. Austin obviously is doing really well. 35.58 inches, they're seven inches above average for the year. The aquifer, as we pointed out earlier, 
took a big jump from those rains now up to 666 even in the 10 day rolling average is 661.8 does not mean we're out of stage one restrictions yet but uh, he is moving in the right direction. It's been a while since we've been up above that 660 mark. So the aquifer trending in a good direction too. Outside blue skies, a couple of thin high clouds, temperatures in the 70s for the most part. Stinson continues to be a little warmer than everybody else. 75 degrees there. Southeast chilly winds anywhere from 5 to 10 miles per hour being reported around San Antonio. 72 in New Braunfels, 68 Canyon Lake, 72 in Hondo, 74 down there in Divine with clear skies. And closing in on 80 degrees for folks down there in Catula and Carrizo Springs, 73 out in Del Rio. Dew points, yeah, it's starting to creep up a little bit. You start to see some of that green color there. It's not necessarily humid, but we are starting to see the dew points creep up into the uh, maybe close to muggy territory. By tomorrow, we'll probably be there. Not so much today and still really dry up across North Texas. But we're starting that process of bringing in the moisture to South Texas and then it spreads north. Takes a little while after these fronts for that to happen, but that's what we're going to be dealing with next couple days. And as that moisture initially comes in, we could see a little bit of patchy fog, um, maybe even tomorrow. Two points will be in the 40s today and then up into the 50s tomorrow and then eventually uh, 60s, as we talked about uh, by the end of the week. That may lead to a shower or two by Saturday or Sunday, although there's no real good trigger anywhere in the forecast. We're kind of looking at a pretty quiet weather pattern across the board this week. Uh, satellite picture does show some thin high clouds working in west to east, but nothing that's very thick and certainly nothing that's springing any rain with it. And as we look at the big picture, boy, this is really pretty quiet for October here across the country. There is a little bit of uh, rain, some wraparound rain there across uh, New England, and you'll find some rain and snow in the higher elevations ac across parts of Nevada in Utah as a little system works its way east, but nothing that really jumps off the page. For us, just more great weather. 78 degrees this afternoon, 75 by 6 o'clock, down to 70 by 8 p.m., and then 65 by 10 p.m. Southeast Julie winds 5 to 10 miles per hour. And we'll go 82 tomorrow. We'll watch for a little bit of patchy fog. I'm not looking for much, but there could be some there. Starting off at 59 tomorrow morning. 84 Wednesday, 86 Thursday, and then mid 80s. Uh, finish out the week and going into the weekend. Next weekend looks good too. Maybe just a little bit more humid, a little bit more cloud cover, maybe a shower or two, but nothing that's uh, those rain chances stay pretty low uh, for now, guys. Thank you so much, Justin. James Bond, no match for Michael Myers at the box office. We're going to take a look at the top five films still ahead. The latest movie in the terrifying saga of Michael Myers and Laurie Strode into theaters this weekend. CNN's Rick Damagella takes a look at the cinematic history of Halloween. John Carpenter's Halloween arrived in theaters in 1978 and has continued to scare audiences through sequels, spinoffs and reboots. Halloween was, you know, kind of a descendant of Psycho and Black Christmas, but Halloween became the standard. It became the movie that all other horror directors, horror writers aspired to do. There's a reason we're supposed to be afraid of this thing. Universal Pictures revived the franchise in 2018 with a direct sequel to the 1978 film, ignoring the other movies released over the decades. It's an interesting thing, and I've, I've heard the term choose your own adventure, if you remember those books from when you were a kid, because if you want to see the Laurie Strode, Laurie Strode film, you can watch you know the first film and then go to 2018 and Halloween Kills. Uh, if you want to see Dan Daniel Harris and Jamie Lloyd and her story, you could watch four, f four and five, and well, I mean, I guess you can watch six, but you're going to be sadly disappointed. Director David Gordon Green's Halloween Kills picks up moments after his 2018 film. I love Michael Myers, and I love the the mythology, the very scattered mythology in the series. I think David Gordon Green has elevated the series. We're caring about the characters. These are these these feel like real people. Forty years ago, the boogeyman came for us. We are the survivors of Michael Myers. Watching with the lights on in Hollywood, I'm Rick Damagella. And speaking of the movie business, it's showing signs of coming back from the dead or the pandemic. 
The horror film, he mentioned it, Halloween Kills, took the top spot in the box office with the highest opening weekend since the pandemic began. The latest horror flick in the long-running franchise opened with $50.4 million in ticket sales, even as it also debuted on a streaming service. People love to get scared. No Time to Die didn't have much time on the top. The Bond flick fell to second in its sophomore weekend, earning $24.3 million. For a 10-day domestic total of just under $100 million, though, Denim, Let There Be Carnage, came in third place. The Addams Family 2 finished in fourth in its third weekend out. And the last duel had a rough first weekend. The historical epic debuted in fifth place. Are you working on some home renovations? We are. SA Live has you covered, though, from DIY wallpapering to home hacks to the one thing you definitely don't want to DIY. They're sharing it all again today in their home improvement show. Mike and Fiona, here you go. Oh, well, it's our home improvement show brought to you by Jason's Water System. Yeah, all sorts of uh, tips and tricks and everything. Over the years, I've learned a lot of little DIY things that's going to make uh, simple tasks a lot easier and maybe some little uh, tricks you can use when you kind of glue stuff around the house as well. One thing you don't want to DIY if your foundation is not good. We've got an expert to talk about that. And if you want to save money on your electricity bill, how about going solar? South Texas Solar Systems is here to show you how. All right, you want to spruce up a room? Have you thought about wallpaper? Now, we're not talking about doing the entire room, maybe just an accent wall. This is a great tip. You're going to love watching this one. And how about taking that decorating outside to your patio? We have great ways to completely redecorate your patio and make it a space you can enjoy. And what was great is when you think it's good enough, you, know, you add those little touches to it and it makes it just fantastic. Oh, all that and more when SA Live continues in just a few minutes.